Um, at the very early stage, one of the biggest challenges that leadership faces, and I'm talking early stage, like five people, is we constantly change our minds and how to, how to propagate that down to the team so we're staying on track because what we're doing today may be different from what we're going to do tomorrow. Right. And, and then you get like tons of buy-in to an idea and everyone's all pumped up, right? And then you're like, okay, we're changing. Okay, we're moving that way. Yeah, yeah, everyone deals with that one. Flexible and able to pivot the flexibility is a piece of it, but it is a core issue. I mean, I, as I said, we pivoted <laughs> publicly at least a dozen times over five years, and it was like get everybody charged up and ready. Here's the mountain we're going to take, and three weeks later we were off in another direction. That's a reality, right? So, um, I, you know, if other people have stories, I'd love to hear them. I, I can talk about our stuff all the time, but but if other people have, Do have experienced have stories that. About how they didn't do that or worked with that energy. So going from a team of two to a team of four, adding a, uh, a sociologist uh, for, for a, a community culture, uh, for a web for a web platform for us, um, and a programmer, we went from being able to uh, to you know bounce ideas off of each other and get ideas from our mentors, and then. Uh, you know, change our course of action with no, no necessary result to there being a very drastic byproduct of that where, you know, we all, as you said, came together when we went full steam um, and then changed what we were, uh, changed what we were, changed our plan, you know, I mean, uh, decided maybe we don't have a strong enough uh, data set to, to validate our old idea, but now, based on our mentor's idea, now we totally do. Um, so yeah, potential solution. Potential solution. If you are making decisions, back them with at least some data other than your own perspective or somebody's perspective, because in the end, it is your company, it's not your mentors. So that's what that's what put my mentor. I mean, I, so two two thoughts on this, and I know I'm coming in late to this it's conversation. Okay. Katie's so kind and forgiving. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. I mean, I, I tell everybody. Now I'm on a whole lot, whole lot of boards, right? And I actually think being a board member is a really dangerous, it's a really dangerous role in a lot of ways. One is you're their investor, board member. They, the, the CEO wants you to, generally wants you to feel good about what's going on. Um, and you, you create this dynamic, right, where you're giving advice where you have opinions. And the CEO wants to satisfy on some level those opinions. And, and I tell the CEOs, if I tell you to do something, you do it, and it's wrong, you screwed up. Right? And, and, and this goes to the mentor thing very much as well, which is the CEO is there or the leader of whatever function, same thing, doesn't matter, they're the CEO of their function, right? They're there and they, they're empowered to be there because they're supposed to be making those decisions, right? And they should be open-minded and they should learn from the people they believe in and get the best advice they can and also get other stakeholder advice, even if it's not perhaps the advice you would most seek out or you most, hopefully, my, my CEO's both like my advice and they include it as a stakeholder. But the point is not to build consensus with everybody, right? You've got to figure out what you believe is the right decision. So you take in all this data, but you can't have whiplash from mentors because whiplash suggests almost you're, you're worried about satisfying these people or you're, you're being moved meaningfully by their advice as opposed to it's data that's helping me figure out what do I believe and what don't I believe? What's my filter for this is, makes sense to me and this doesn't? And, and how do I make the right decision for me that I believe is the right decision? And the, the main thing is you never forget this when you're leading, again, a function or a CEO. Nobody has the data points you have. There's no one advising you that has like, a, like even close to, and I tell my CEOs, it's not like I, you have 100x the data points I have, you have a million x the data points I have, right? Or something like that. Actually, Bujan and I were just talking about this. And, and, and because of that, again, I can have strong opinions at a distance but hopefully I can help you understand why I feel that way, but ultimately you've got to filter that and figure that out, and that's true, advisors, mentors, yeah. doesn't matter. I mean, that's the muscle you're building as a founding team, really, is data, and then ability to make your own decisions, and own the mistakes as well, right? But if you don't exercise that muscle and you're constantly being pulled yeah. one way and another, you're probably not gonna make it. You're, you're almost, so, I think you'll never make, like you if, won't if, make it. If you wanna run a company by taking people's advice, like just find smart people, they tell you what to do and you just move in those directions, you, you're, to me, you're guaranteed to fail. 
you have to have a point of view. I want to make sure we get back though to what I think may have been buried inside this question also, which is even as a as a founder of a company, regardless of how good you are at assimilating data, you are constantly evolving the way you think about your business, and it's dangerous, we were talking about extreme transparency before, that if you're constantly giving your team lots of deflecting updates on the vision, it can feel frantic. So I do think, especially if, you know, for us, if we had those moments when we brought the team in and said, this is the new plan, this is the new big deal, we had to know that that was a commitment that we were making, that we were behind for some period of time. That couldn't be every week we have a brand new rah-rah, let's go get a meeting. You've got to sort of build up that plan when you feel like you have something that you know you're going to commit to and you're going to marshal in that direction. That's when you drew the big push to get everybody running in that direction. And then you have to have sort of the conviction to understand that you've got to carry that out to see the results rather than to just sort of have a new whim next week and try to kick them off in a whole new direction. Yeah, and I think to build on that, um, if you agree as a team that there are certain milestones, they're going to tell you you're heading in the right direction, then once you've achieved them, you can you can sort of set it up that then we're going to set up the next march, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the danger, I think, is when you try to bite off more than you know you can chew. So the recommendation is um, set, a, set a vision um, and then break it down into some achievable chunks. See if you set your assumptions together about how you think it's going to play out. And then keep revisiting those. And set an expectation that, hey, if, if this direction isn't working and here's how we're going to know it's not working, then we're going to have to reset and set a new course. And we're going to figure out how to do that together. And that's where so, having them, as you mentioned <coughs> before, having the team invested in the decision-making process at a certain level is actually really beneficial because they're now bought into the checkpoints along the way and they want to now engage in the, and many times I found with our team, we got to the point where they could see the new direction even before I had articulated it to them, right? They had saw the data. They knew what we were doing wasn't working and they already had ideas that were sort of in the direction we wanted to go. That was way more powerful than if I just swooped in the room with a new idea. Right. So, so just last thought, just set up a mini pro little tiny little process around that, little tiny one, to help plan so that you don't feel that whipsaw and your team doesn't feel that whipsaw. So can I, can I, just one more thing sort of philosophically on this, and when Katie and I were doing talking about the topic, I, very much on my mind was, yeah, sorry. Very much on my mind was a blog post I recently wrote called Sell the, Vi uh, Sell the Vision, um, not the progress. And the, the idea is that running startups is really hard. A lot of stuff goes wrong. It goes wrong all the time, right? People should expect it to go wrong. Not, not fatally wrong, but like constantly wrong. You know, there's constant things you're trying to fight against to make something successful. And if you're constantly trying to sell people on the progress, they start believing that everything's supposed to go right and then all of a sudden we stumble again, we stumble again, we stumble again. It's so painful, right? Including investors, but, but everybody, right? Your employees, your, you know, but if you're selling people on the vision, if they're there because what they really believe in, and I know you guys touched on this, is this vision, and then everyone expects you're gonna have a lot of problems and challenges along the way, people persevere through those challenges and then you create this culture where first thing people want to do is actually put the challenges up front as opposed to when you're selling progress everyone wants to hide the challenges because they they want to ignore those they want to kind of pretend they don't exist because whatever what you're selling everybody the reason everyone's enthusiastic is look how awesome things are going right now so then nobody wants to be the guy in the room is like well have you noticed our users actually aren't using the product at all we're selling a lot of it but they're not using it or we're they're you know we're getting them through an through a um, acquisition curve but nobody comes back Right, and no, nobody says that because everyone's so fixated on the culture of success here is about selling the progress, right? And but it, then you get people. We talked about this a little earlier, working on how to solve that issue together. If you if you if you, if you, you focus the on the yeah, on the vision, on the vision and, try and try to unearth the challenges, and, and, the, on and, and everyone focuses on it. Right. And by the way, I would say, as CEO, my job got so much easier and less stressful when I focus everyone on the problems because when I focus everyone on the progress. Then I owned the problems by myself and I was a little bit afraid to like put them out on the table and just, the stress was just enormous. When all of a sudden every conversation was, let's get in the room and figure out how we're going to solve X. Because that's all you're doing in a startup every day is solving problems. I think this ties in a little bit 
the extreme transparency, but one of the things that we did in Facebook was uh, we clean up hands. The, we first stole the idea from, I mean, lots of places to do this, but Google in particular does like a Friday afternoon TGIF, like get everyone together to talk about the problem. And I think that was a big thing to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Like, if anyone has any lingering questions or concerns, and then this also ties into your point about celebrating small successes, like just getting everyone in the room together and being like, this is what we did this week that we were happy about. This is, these are their challenges. What you need to want to talk about. I think just making sure that everyone was on the same page was really important to kind of keeping us all on track together. There's one point that I want to make though. Yeah, so can you come? We can also, yeah. Bring your chairs forward. Sorry. Well, it's a little intimidating, not too far from We will go louder too. Do you want to just repeat just the summary of the content? Because it didn't sound like everyone didn't hear it. You talked about doing uh, company all hands meetings and sort of marshalling everybody around the problems as a regular sort of course of business. One of the things that I want to extend a little bit is I think we're thinking a lot about the sort of tactical, what are the challenges we're doing every day. One of the things that was very effective for us was to also create a little bit of a break. So once a month, we had a different kind of meeting. We called it a founder fireside chat. And it was largely agenda-less. It was a, all questions are fair game. There was no limit on what people could come in and talk about. And it was a great sort of group dialogue. And then once a quarter, I had these records, uh, these meetings, and they were sort of, I don't know that they have a good name, but I would intentionally put a bizarre meeting title on everyone's calendar. Like, the first one I did, the guy still teased me about, was called No Roses. And I just put that on people's calendar, No Roses, two-hour meeting, nobody had any idea what it was. And it was by design. They all came in the room and I said, close the door, forget whatever it is that you're working on, leave all of that behind. If we had two weeks to drop everything and completely skyrocket our business in the right direction, what would you like to work on? And we had a whole brainstorming session for an hour and a half. The No Roses one actually, what it was is, there's this great blog post that I'm gonna forget now who the CEO was, but he said he comes in the office and he always liked to talk to the janitors because they were really like no bullshit guys. When like all of his direct reports were always saying the nice things, always being friendly, always agreeing with everything, essentially the kind of yes person philosophy. Um, and the No Roses meeting was, you know, I'm sure that we are not doing a lot of things well around here. Let's brainstorm all the things that we could wave a magic wand that we would be better at. And we did, we just brainstormed nonstop. So sometimes you have to break away from the kind of day-to-day -day grind of the individual tasks that you're worrying about and get people to free think a little bit bigger. And I think it, it matches very well that kind of philosophy. David? Yeah, I, I'm a small company, three people right now, it used to be four, and um, that's part of the story. We did this two different ways. I had a co-founder, and we used to try and figure out how we were going to pivot, where we were going to go, what we were going to work on, focus on together, and then together go to the team and try and move on. And uh, you know, as was being described before, that co-founder is no longer involved in the day to day because that process just got more and more difficult and we were just not on the same pace, um, which is different from not being on the same page, but we just were not on the same pace. So now it's it's me and I sit down with my small team on a weekly basis and I don't drive the agenda at the beginning. I let them talk. And then we go through what's working, what isn't working. We all kind of gain agreement. And then we bring up the new ideas. Uh, and we go through those and try and I'm not much of a consensus builder, so for me it's usually an effort. Uh, and I'm working against my kind of uh, uh, top-down drive, push it in. But I find that that experience for me working against my own nature is a good thing that gets us all into we're a relatively small company too. We got uh, eight people, a couple part timers, but I think we can. Yeah, sure. So we can go as loud as. Yeah, standing up is good. Do it. The um, the communication piece is sort of paramount, right? So you know, no one's afraid to fail if we all know why we're failing and all that kind of stuff. But I think what I've found useful is to help people engage in each other's problems. So when you get big enough to have functions, like here's your engineering group, here's your sales guys and marketing guys. Perspective is critical, and if I can sit in front of the engineering team and just say, oh, if we could just figure out a way to talk to this customer or present better or market better or whatever, these engineers are smart guys, and they're not bogged down in the same stuff that sales guys have been looking at all day. And the perspective could be, why don't you just do that? And it's, you know, like that light bulb moment. I think just to 
the overall communication, but beneath that is sharing the problems that a lot of other people might be able to solve if you are sort of humble enough to share them. Um, we, I, I've been fairly successful with that as well. And I, I guess I would say that also with my business way back in the day, um, if there was something going wrong, everybody was talking about it anyways. And so everybody knew what was going wrong, where, whether it was a product issue, a sales issue, a marketing issue. Um, but And then being able to just talk about it at lunch, at, over coffee, um, as a CEO, being able to just be open and talking was very helpful. The one area that I had the biggest struggle with was the people issues. You know, nobody, you're not going to want to be open when this guy here is a real idiot or jerk or, you know, and nobody wants him here or some people do. Or in my case, I happen to have uh, a family member in the company and, you know, I was not going to get rid of my family, but other people were very resentful of that. So, and it's like, how do you talk, how do you deal with the people issues? So what did you, were you just radically open about it? Like, I was radically, as far as, you know, the, the, the people issues, like with my uh, with family, I just told people, no, I'm not getting rid of this person, live with it. As far as product, sales, revenue, you know, anything like that, it was very easy to talk openly at company meetings or at lunch. But it, it was very difficult. I never really found a great way to talk about the, the people issues of hiring the wrong person. How do you fire somebody? quickly, or in my case, when I raised venture money, it was a stipulation I had to bring in a, a professional CEO. You know, how do you get rid of that person when they're basically, they're actually over you? We did so, <laughs> so, you know, what, one... <laughs> Wait, hold on. <laughs> no, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Okay, yeah, there's a lot so, so, you know, one of the challenges, one of the challenges I had, right, was we had um, two senior executives who were both very good at their jobs, um, who couldn't stand each other. And they needed to work with each other a lot. And a lot of our points of failure were sitting at the junction of the two, and they both thought the other one was completely responsible. Um, that, for me as CEO, is extremely difficult. And I spent a lot of time refereeing interpersonally. But what I tried to do at the, team manage at the management team level was just like get everyone really hard on the problems. Right? Just like keep everyone, stay, stay the hell away from whose fault it is, and just like, just keep trying to say, how are we progressing on these problems? How do we measure how we're progressing on these problems? You know, what are some hypotheses about how we can improve against these problems? And somebody would say, well, you know, something like, well, if, if the manufacturing team would just do X, Y, and Z and be like, okay, so one idea is maybe, maybe this could work in manufacturing, what other ideas? Yeah. But it, just trying to keep talking about, you know, what isn't working, why isn't it working, but like really tough on problems, try to be pretty easy on people unless we lost confidence in people. And that's a very different place to be. And uh, you know, the family business thing, that's a really tough, I, I don't actually have a good experience there. I wrote another one also that I see work very effectively in a lot of early stage startups. I play the who owns it game with the founders. And what I mean is like, you will take personal responsibility if this doesn't happen for your company. And it's one thing to say it, and it's another thing to enact it in a company. To, to say like, okay, who owns our user engagement metrics? We, I, I was actually going to yeah. jump on the this exact same like, point. It's a great game. So, such a wonderful game. It, and Katie, game, it works later too. Even when there are functional leaders, forever. you often find there's all these jump balls that yeah. are really key. Yep. Yes, and that really game is really effective. And it's an effective game, but you also have to implement it with a little bit of a sense of humor in the beginning, because if you don't, you can really disrupt your team like where it blows up, but I think that's a really great technique through a storm. If someone's failing though, how do you deal with the leader that's failing on their metrics? Anybody? So I own user engagement. It's failing. We have really bad user engagement. What do you do? I'm, I'm one of the co-founders, the VP of marketing. What do you do? What do you, what do, you do as a team? What, do you, what have you guys done in situations like that? So it's a tough one. Come on, Lindsay, you gotta I, mean, I, I, I can talk. I, like I said, I got stories for all this but stuff. But who else has stories? Well, I think you gotta pull back. Uh, if, if you see individual, you know, unit level, functional level failure, to whether or not it's a bad plan or a bad execution of the plan. 
right? Because if it's a bad plan, nobody's going to be able to execute it. So, so the you, team. Do you figure it out as a team, or do you figure it out as a CEO? I think. Uh, I think it depends how big it is, right? Okay. If it, and also how much confidence you have in the rest of your team to have so input have to the plan. Story? Give me a story when that's happened and you figured it out. Um, well, I don't know if I can get it, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I think I think pulling back to is it a good plan or not, and is it a good execution? Because the failure could be either place or both places, and if it's bad execution, uh, that can probably that probably doesn't get fixed by that same person. If it's a bad plan. Well, then we can maybe fix the plan and have the same person execute the new plan. But bad execution usually doesn't get fixed. That's got to go. I don't think you can leave it to the team to fix it. I don't have this experience. But are you open with the team about I think you have to have first passes.